Greetings, my friends. I want to thank you all for subscribing. I want to thank all of my channel members for supporting me in this endeavor to save pop culture. And if you are not subscribed, please consider supporting this channel. We need you. Thank you. Today, I have a particularly fascinating story to share with you. Something that was called to my attention that may alter how we look at J.J. Abrams' involvement in the Disney sequel trilogy. Recently, a leak appeared on Imgur.com, purporting to be the original treatment for Star Wars Episode VIII, allegedly written by J.J. Abrams and Lawrence Kasdan. This treatment is radically different from what Bruin Johnson created under instructions from Kathleen Kennedy, and having read the treatment, I can attest that it is vastly superior to the vile swill that Disney slopped into the public troughs under Kennedy's administration. Everyone knows my often stated view that Abrams is the cinematic antichrist, and that he or his minor demons from Bad Robot like Alex Kurtzman, Akiva Goldsman, Damon Lindelof, and Carlton Coos soil and destroy everything they touch. And yet, here we have this treatment that is orders of magnitude better than anything else we got in the Disney sequel trilogy, which begs the question, is this document legitimate? Is this actually the original vision for Episode 8 before Kennedy perverted it with identity politics and turned it over to the arch-hack Ruin Johnson? Because if it is authentic, a grave injustice has been done to Star Wars fans, to Lawrence Kasdan, and God help me, to J.J. Abrams himself, whose vision for the sequel trilogy was better than we were led to believe. In this video, I will examine the circumstances of this leak, summarize the plot presented in the document with analysis of its merits and weaknesses, and finally debate the central question, is this leak genuine? The alleged leaker goes by the name Bootsy Playboy. This individual claims to have worked at Bad Robot from 2014 to 2015 as a computer tech, and he claims that while he was there, he came across Abrams' treatment for Episode 8, and he claims he snapped pictures of the treatment, which was printed on red paper. Bootsy Playboy then posted these images on Imgur.com, and it is this treatment that I am reporting on today. What you're about to hear is a summary of those pages, hitting all the salient points of the alleged treatment, after which I will critique the treatment and discuss its authenticity or lack thereof. This alleged version of Episode 8 picks up immediately where Episode 7 left off, with Rey handing Luke back his lightsaber. Luke smiles and accepts the gift, gazing with great fondness at his father's lightsaber. And then he thanks Rey by name, expressing his satisfaction that she has finally arrived at his island where she belongs. In this scene, finally, we get to see the Luke Skywalker that we always longed for, the wise Jedi Master who retains, despite his advanced years, a vestige of the twinkle in his eyes he had as a youth. Luke tells Rey that he has been influencing events across the galaxy from this island, for it is a place of great power, a nexus for the light side of the Force and the source of the original Jedi Temple. From here, Luke has been engaged in a struggle against the dark side, for there is another planet that is a nexus for the dark side of the Force, and a confrontation between dark and light that will determine the fate of the galaxy is only 90 sunsets away. At this point, Luke hands the lightsaber back to Rey and tells her to hang on to it. Luke built himself another lightsaber years ago anyway, and Rey is going to need it before this is all through. Suddenly, a beautiful middle-aged woman appears with two children. This is Luke's family, his wife Audra, and their two children, a boy named Tyus and Kay, his sister. Audra is gracious to Rey and invites her to dinner. Rey is overwhelmed by all of this and accepts the invitation gladly. As they walk to Luke's home, Rey tells Luke that General Leia Organa sent her to find him, that he's needed to help lead the resistance in this time of war, that R2 and Chewie are here with her in the... She trails off, and Luke nods, yes, in the Millennium Falcon. Luke observed her landing with it on the other side of the island. He was regrettably unable to exert his influence to save Han, he admits with sorrow, for Han was out of his reach. Luke tells Rey 
He has been communing with Leia, and that everything is unfolding, as prophesied. There will be a great battle in 90 days, no sooner. There is time to prepare, but most importantly in this scene, Luke reveals the truth about Rey. A truth that fixes a lot of the problems with the Disney sequel trilogy and explains why Rey was able to do all the things she can do. As it turns out, Luke was employing a Jedi trick that Masters once used to train their Padawans, and all through Episode 7, Luke was using a kind of remote control of the Force to guide and influence her all that time. She knew how to pilot the Millennium Falcon because Luke knew how to do it. She was able to defeat Kylo Ren because Luke was remotely assisting her in the fight. Far from being a useless cowardly traitor sucking manatee milk on a remote island, licking his wounds and sulking, as Ruin Johnson would have us believe, Luke was in fact waging war against the dark side all this time. Snoke was stationed on the planet Sacrum, a nexus of the dark side, and Luke was countering him all along on Acto, this island nexus of the light side. Both planets are cloaked, hidden from scrutiny, but Luke had a plan for locating Sacrum all along, a gambit that failed. The only way to get to Snoke, to infiltrate his cloaked planet and bypass his defenses, was with a Trojan horse, Kylo Ren. Luke trained Kylo in both the dark and the light sides of the Force. Kylo was to serve as Luke's spy, but sadly, Kylo was too weak to shoulder the burden, and he succumbed to the dark side of the Force. He is Snoke's creature now. We then cut to General Hux on the bridge of a Super Star Destroyer named The Siege. Snoke appears to Hux in a hologram, telling him that Kylo Ren's recovery is nearly complete and Hux's top priority is to locate Luke Skywalker. Hux assures Snoke that they are actively analyzing data to pinpoint Luke's hidden planet. Meanwhile, on Mustafar inside Darth Vader's castle, Kylo Ren thrashes inside Vader's back to tank, as nano droids replace the damaged parts of his face with biometallic tissue, essentially turning Kylo into something resembling a monster. This is far superior to the little band-aid that Kylo wears in The Last Jedi, a small cosmetic conceit designed to preserve his attractiveness to encourage all the Raylo shippers. In this version of the story, Kylo Ren is much more monstrous, with a damaged eye and a face that is half metallic, and there is none of the idiotic teen romance bullshit that made Star Wars fans dry heave and Raylo's dry hump in their theater seats. Back on Acto, as Rey, Chewie, and R2 dine with Luke and his family, Luke tells Rey that Kylo will find this island in 90 sunsets. It is prophesied and will come to pass, but that Luke is prepared, for this entire planet is a trap for Kylo, and Luke Skywalker is the bait. Killing Kylo is pointless because the Force would then simply manifest another powerful dark side user, so the plan is to lure Kylo to the island and then trap him there forever. Meanwhile, back on the Imperial Star Destroyer, while searching for Skywalker's hidden planet, Hux gets ambushed by an X-Wing squadron led by Poe and Finn. As the battle rages, Poe manages to insert BB-8 onto the Star Destroyer. BB-8 sneaks around the Star Destroyer until he locates the droids conducting the analysis to locate Octo. Once there, he hacks into their system and feeds them a false location for Luke Skywalker to buy the Resistance more time and lead the First Order on a wild goose chase. Meanwhile, on Sacrum, Snoke dispatches yet another of his apprentices, a woman named Dathan Knott, to go to Mustafar and monitor Kylo Ren. It's not clear why he asks this, if he's suspicious of Kylo, or if he's worried Kylo is too injured to be effective in his mission. But regardless, she departs for Vader's castle on Mustafar. Back on Acto, Luke shows Rey the ancient Jedi Temple. There he shows her the archives of the Knid, ancient Force-sensitive archivists who recorded the past and future history of the Jedi. There, Rey glimpses herself handing the lightsaber to Luke Skywalker. They saw all of it. Rey also sees the coming battle as three Jedi figures stand against a horde of dark-clad beings, the Knights of Ren. 
Rey asks who the third Jedi is. Luke tells her that after Order 66, this planet became a refuge for Jedi who survived the Purge, and the third Jedi is on her way. Meanwhile, Luke hands Rey an ancient holocron and instructs her to meditate on it and to enter this opening into the Living Force. Rey does so, flickers in and out of sight, and has a vision of herself clad in golden armor, seated in a vast temple on a metallic throne, her eyes glowing red. Suddenly, the palace is attacked by Jedi Knights. Rey snaps out of the vision and Luke informs her it's a vision from 300 generations past. Back on Mustafar, Kylo Ren sees his monstrous face in a mirror and smashes it to pieces. Dathan Nott tells him Snoke sent her to monitor Kylo. Kylo countermands Snoke's orders and commands her to accompany him to find the last owner of the Millennium Falcon, Unkar Plutt. She kneels and submits to his authority, calling him master. So apparently she has, unbeknownst to Snoke, pledged her loyalty to Kylo and they are working together. Meanwhile, General Leah is pleased at BB-8's successful infiltration of the siege. They have a plan not merely to divert General Hux, but to destroy him and his Star Destroyer. The false coordinates BB-8 gave them will lead them to jump into a sector with a massive and uncharted black hole. The plan is, once they jump in, the Resistance will be there to attack and apply force to push Hux into the black hole. Back on Acto, Rey is training on the beach when a gigantic sea monster catches her by surprise. She is almost killed, but at the last moment she is saved by Ahsoka Tano, the third Jedi destined to fight in the final battle against Kylo and the Knights of Ren. Now we start to get into heavy action sequences that are easily summarized, and since we're going for an overview here, I won't waste time dramatizing it. Hux falls into the trap laid by General Leia, and as he attempts to avoid the black hole, the Star Destroyer is attacked by resistance forces as capital ships bombard the siege and squadrons of X-Wing's dogfight TIE fighters. Just as Hux's forces appear on the verge of victory, BB-8 hacks into the Star Destroyer's thruster array, shooting the Star Destroyer into the black hole. Captain Phasma manages to evacuate just in the nick of time with a force of lucky stormtroopers, but Hux dies as the Star Destroyer is crushed. And a droid defecting from the siege is brought before General Leia. This droid gives General Leia information that Snoke is on Sacrum and has an ancient artifact there that is a threat to the New Republic. This droid, oddly enough, has the coordinates for the planet and the key to infiltrating it, a vial of artificial Sith blood that will allow agents injected with it to sneak through Snoke's defenses. Now this part, in my mind, is extremely cheesy. Yes, this protocol droid was abducted and pressed into service by the First Order, and yes, it might be sympathetic to the New Republic, but isn't it convenient? It knows Snoke's location and has the fabulous special synthetic Sith blood to penetrate the defenses? Oddly enough, this bungled bit of plotting seems very Abrams-like to me, and his affinity of things like the Sith Dagger and the stupid holocrons, mystery boxes and whatnot, this part actually tends to lend a bit of credence to this being a treatment by Abrams, although I remain skeptical, but I'll discuss that here in a bit. So it turns out BB-8 was not destroyed along with Hux, but rather managed to sneak aboard Phasma's evacuation ship. BB-8 gets a distress signal out to Poe, and so they set off after Phasma's ship to rescue the droid. Leia, oddly enough, enlists five bounty hunters loyal to the Resistance to go to Sacrum and retrieve the object. This is odd. Why doesn't Leia send her own Resistance forces to do the job? I guess maybe these bounty hunters have a special expertise, but... Regardless, they head off to Sacrum, injected with MacGuffin juice, uh, I mean, artificial Sith blood, Jesus, as the rest of the Resistance heads for Acto to join Luke, Rey, and Ahsoka. On Acto, we get a training montage with Luke and Rey. Yes, thank God, Luke is actually training Rey. Goodbye, Mary Sue, hello, heart. They hold a much-needed service, 
in an old Jedi graveyard for Han Solo. And afterwards, Luke points out a tombstone for an ancient Sith witch who turned to the light side, named Talston Lit. There is a handprint on the tombstone, and Rey reaches down to touch it. And Luke presents Rey with a new outfit, his own robes from Return of the Jedi, altered to fit her. A nice passing of the torch moment there, and one that the sequel trilogy badly needed. Cut to Sacrum as a First Order ship arrives. Somehow, a random First Order ship knows where Snoke's hidden planet is? Once again, despite the equality of this treatment in many regards, it is idiocy like this that convinces me this might well be the work of J.J. Abrams. Anyway, these stormtroopers who, it is implied, escaped from the siege as it was being crushed by the black hole, tell Snoke what happened. Snoke attempts to locate Kylo Ren, but he cannot find him. His homing beacon is either damaged or deactivated. Meanwhile, Kylo Ren and his forces arrive at Acto, and the final battle begins. Kylo, Dathan Nott, and the Knights of Ren attack. Now, I don't know how they found Acto, apparently from the former owner of the Millennium Falcon, I don't know, but they show up. You know how these things are in Abrams movies. At any rate, Kylo, Dathan Nott, and the Knights of Ren attack. Chewie and R2 engage them with the Falcon and blow the wings off of Kylo's ship. Kylo crashes in the surf and emerges with Dathan Nott to face Rey and Ahsoka in an epic lightsaber duel. Kylo drives Rey to the edge of a cliff and she jumps off, landing on a hovering Millennium Falcon. She gets away. And meanwhile, in a fantastic display of sheer Jedi badassery, we finally get to see Jedi Master Luke Skywalker dispatch the Knights of Ren. This sequence sounds like exactly what fans have been clamoring for all these years, and it's a shame we'll never see it, regardless of whether or not this is authentically Abrams' work. Meanwhile, Kylo is headed for the Jedi Temple, looking to steal or perhaps destroy the ancient Jedi holocron that gave Rey her vision of the armor-clad red-eyed Sith attacked by Jedi 300 generations ago. Rey and Kylo engage in a fierce duel there as Ahsoka manages to defeat Dathan Nott on the beach. Phasma, somehow, has located Octo as well. Perhaps Kylo called and gave them the location at last, it isn't explained, nor is it really explained again why Kylo was able to find this planet that was hidden, but nevertheless, her forces are engaged by Poe, Finn, and squadrons of X-Wings. During the battle, of course, Poe manages to retrieve BB-8 from Phasma's ship, and BB-8 is fine. Back at the Jedi Temple, Kylo manages to disarm Rey. Just as he is about to kill Rey, Kylo finds himself frozen as Luke's young son Tyus reveals himself. He is freezing Kylo with a force as his sister Kay pushes a button on the wall, dropping an impenetrable force field over Kylo and Rey. Luke and Ahsoka appear, and Kylo threatens to kill Rey inside the force field. Rey, however, picks up the Jedi holocron, meditates on it as before, and vanishes. The trap has worked and Kylo will be imprisoned there for all eternity. Meanwhile, on Sacrum, Leia's bounty hunters find the object Snoke is planning to use against the Resistance. One of her agents snaps a picture of it and sends it back to Leia, just as he is killed by Snoke. Back aboard her ship, Leia sees what it is that Snoke possesses. It is nothing less than Luke's severed hand. Somehow he is going to use this hand against the Resistance, in episode 9, and in a post credit scene, we see Rey appear in that same throne room 300 generations past, wearing golden armor with flaming red eyes. She is now the Sith Witch Talston Lit, stranded in the past. So, what do I think of this treatment as a treatment? Regardless of whether or not it is Abrams' work, it is far better than the hideously insulting abomination that Ruin Johnson created. This script respects Luke Skywalker and Star Wars fans. It explains that Luke was the reason for Rey's amazing abilities, and it confirms that Luke was not a cowardly milksucker who tried to murder his nephew and betrayed the galaxy. He went to the island because it was a seat of power, 
giving him the ability to fight against Snoke's dark influence and prepare for an inevitable battle with Kylo Ren. He trained Ren in both light and dark techniques to place him next to Snoke, but Kylo was too weak and succumbed to the dark side. They pay tribute to Han, they have a pretty nice trap for Hux, they bring in Ahsoka. This is a script that, if filmed, could have saved Star Wars. Absolutely, there are some very dumb things about it. Dumb things that seem very much like trademarked Abrams devices. But even so, we would have been much better off with this script, which at least would have paid tribute to Luke, to canon. Largely, there are some canon violations here too. And it would have basically saved the fans a lot of heartache. But is it authentic? Is this really Abrams treatment? There's no way to be certain, although there are aspects of this story that make me skeptical. It seems weird to me, for example, that Bootsy Playboy would identify himself like that, stating what job he did at Bad Robot and when, even to the point of revealing what part of the office he was seated in. Wouldn't that expose him to all sorts of liability? Furthermore, why is the document printed on red paper? Why does it say J.J. Abrams on the top of every page in big letters? Why is there no copyright information on the cover? Why would a computer tech, of all people, have access to this document? Unless it was circulating around the offices generally, especially a document of this sensitivity. As far as I know, Lawrence Kasdan was only contracted to write the original script, yet here he is credited with writing at least one treatment. Interesting that Kasdan is listed first as the author of this treatment, and J.J. Abrams follows him. Also, it's peculiar that in terms of structure, this treatment is heavily weighted in length towards the first act. Act 2 is relatively short, as is Act 3. In screenplay terms, the first act is generally around 30 pages, Act 2 is about 60 pages, and Act 3, again, is about 30 pages. This is hardly conclusive, however, since Acts 2 and 3 would have a lot of action in them, and Act 1 would be more heavily weighted towards setting up the narrative, which would probably skew the length in the treatment. It's very hard to say, one way or another. Barring confirmation by someone at Bad Robot or Abrams himself, we may never know. But I find it interesting how this treatment in just 13 pages fixes a large majority of the issues that destroyed Star Wars. It's easy to see why Kennedy would shred this treatment. She wanted to make Rey the bestest ever without the help of a man. And she wanted to degrade and humiliate Luke Skywalker as a symbol of the patriarchy. Well, thanks, Kathleen. You ruined Star Wars, perhaps forever. But at least here is a glimpse, authentic or not, of what could have been. From the center of the earth, this is Dictor Van Doomcock bidding you all, my friends, stay angry. Ha 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 